In the, on the eastern coast of the United States, in Canada, there's some guy driving up and down Canada with a Geiger counter finding huge amounts of radioactivity in puddles. Even here, we got Michael Misha to get the information from the Atomic Weapons Authority establishment in Aldermaston, where they have filters, and we found high levels of plutonium, only in two filters, but, but this is still a hot particle of plutonium, so somebody can inhale it. And if something is not done about this Fukushima continuing fissioning, and, and they don't seem to be know, to know what to do about it, they haven't, doing any, they haven't managed to do anything yet, these things are going to slowly continue to come up, cont help to contaminate the biosphere. So they're going to add to the depleted uranium, they're going to add to Hinkley Point, to Sellafield, to Chernobyl, to the weapons fallout from global testing, to all of these sources, which are all underpinned by this one risk model, the risk model of the International Commission on Radiological Protection, which even its author says is incorrect. So what I suggest you all do, because, uh, you know, uh, otherwise it's all doom and gloom, you may as well all go and cut our throats and jump up a cliff, you know, um, is to take down Hinkley Point. Hinkley Point is Agincourt. Yeah. Um, we, we, have the, we have the French, the French are, are buying up uranium all over the world. I was in South Africa, they're buying it there. I was in Tanzania, they're buying it there. They're, they're going up there in Canada, the Arriva company, Kojima, they're buying uranium. They, have, they are the big deal when it comes to nuclear. And they are, again, as they did in 1066, and as they tried to at various times since then, they are trying to invade the British Isles. And they're doing so by building a nuclear power station at, at Hinkley Point in Somerset. Now, the Stop Hinkley organization, this lady will say something about this, is going to have a massive demonstration there sometime in October, is it? Any who can tell us about it. But what I say to you, is that I have, I, the, the one thing that I have managed to show is that it's possible to change the world by direct action. And long ago in 93, I cha chained myself to a nuclear power station in Wales, Trisconet. And, and because we backed up this direct action with, with scientific information about the dangers from this thing, they shut it down, and, and it's remained shut down. Hooray! So, Just like in Germany, in Gorleben, some of you may know that they also managed to stop the, 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 the transport of nuclear waste to Gorleben last year, just by people power, just by sitting down, chaining themselves up, doing these sorts of things. So if enough of you come, and we don't just piss around with, with, with sort of waving banners around, but we get really stuck in, okay? And this is all set up from the, from the beginning, then we can stop those bastards, all right? Thank you very much. of Chris's slot just to come and talk to you all about the fact that we're um, organising a new campaign called Stop Near Nuclear. If you care about the climate, if you care about the environment, if you care about your children, you really need to mobilise now and join us. We've got some flyers here at the front that you can come and get um, to find out information about the blockade. If you've never been as hardcore as Chris before and tied yourself to a power station or a road, we're going to be having non-violence trainings to teach people how to blockade. We want to create a very safe and inclusive space so that anybody can come and stand up and be counted. It's really, really important that we send a very clear message to the government, to the industry, to Centrica, who are out in the middle of the at the moment about nuclear power, to tell them that we're going to get in their way and that we're going to make it so difficult for them. Nuclear power is not a solution to climate change, it's not a solution to energy security, and it certainly isn't going to keep our lights on. We need the power that comes from the wind, the rain and the sun. We need renewable energy, decentralised energy. And um, we're going to be giving a proper longer talk in the anarchist dome over there at 5 o'clock, if any of you would like to come. But please do come and sign our petition against Hinkley, and please do come and buy the fire. And um, come and join us on the 3rd of October and take the power back. Instead of sitting there saying, what can I do about it? Take the power back and come and join us. Thank you. Okay, well, there's, 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 uh...
right, there's 15 minutes of questions and discussion, and you know, I don't want, I don't want to just be like the guru. You know, let's all kind of mix in here and, and get, get, get our various ideas. Can I just ask you this, first of all? Um, yeah, I, I'm opposed to nuclear, and I want to support the Hinkley blockade. It's really important to the people in Somerset and everywhere that, that people come. I was, uh, I was interested to hear what you were saying. Basically, what I want to know is, for all of us who don't really, we don't have the science, you know, we, we try, and we read stuff, and at the moment, because of this turnaround by a lot of people saying, hey, nuclear is actually not as bad as you think, and all the rest of it, we've got a debate going on now. We can believe, I can think, well, I'm anti-nuclear, and I am for a load of reasons, even if it's just a relatively toxic, I'm against it. But I don't know for sure. It's like, I want to believe that. This is what they say. You want to believe that, but actually, here's the reports, and they contradict that. Chernobyl, this didn't happen. There isn't um, leukemia clusters, all this. I read this in the papers, you know, from people who, whose research on other issues I trusted. So, on the other hand, we say, well, yeah, but they would say that because they're all, they all believe in nuclear power. We can't trust them. Is there some, what's going on there? And is the data that you're talking about actually, like, can we go online and see it? And, you know, how is it that people like George don't see what you're seeing? Okay, well, if we're going to talk about George, let's talk about George. If he's the person I'm talking about, George actually doesn't know anything. This is the problem with George. George is uh, an, a reporter, essentially. Um, and, and George is coached by a chap called Malcolm Grimston, who was his chemistry teacher at Stowe. Okay? Uh, Malcolm Grimston is the main psycho ops, psychological operations director, if you like to think of that. If you imagine the nuclear industry, you know, rather like Winston Churchill in the war, some kind of operations room, pushing things around. But, um, Grimston boss, he's the guy who organizes. He was taken on board. He's got a degree in, in psychology, uh, from Cambridge, northern guy he is, and I've known him for many, many years. Uh, and 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 he and George are in operation. Now you have to make up your own mind about why it is that George suddenly turned turned, turned around at, at this particular time. My own belief is Fukushima was such such a blow to nuclear expansionists that they had to bring out somebody who was like who was like a, a card that they had that they had up their sleeve. I mean, I talked to a lot of people about this. And I think that George probably is that is that card. As far as as far as you, you believe in research, I actually have to tell you that Brimston and George and none of these people have ever done any plumbing research, okay? If you look at the peer review literature, if we're gonna go there, you know, and actually that's what they say, we should all look at the peer review literature, and I'm not too sure about that myself, because a lot of stuff can't get into the peer review literature. And a lot of people who do this research get, get rubbished and kicked out of universities, like my colleague, uh, like, like uh, Ole Johansson in Stockholm, and like me, actually. We kicked, were kicked out of the, the Karolinska Institute last year. Um, but even so, we had managed to get, my colleague and I in the, US, ECR, in the European Committee had managed to get probably between us maybe hundreds of research papers into the peer review literature. Um, Whereas George has never written anything in the peer review literature, never done any sort of research. Bruce has never done any such research. They just don't have any anybody of the same caliber or status as the people that we have in the European Committee on Radiation Risk. That this is just a fact. Now, if you want to look at websites where we where we lay out set out our stall, if you like, the most the best one is the a website of the of the low level radiation campaign, which is www.llrc.org. Well, what you have to realize is there is, in fact, an enormous mafia, a kind of conspiracy, that, that goes right back to the Cold War era to cover up the health effects of ionizing radiation. And in 1959, the World Health Organization was constrained into an agreement with the International Atomic Energy Agency, both, both of them agencies of the United Nations. And about that time in 59, People, doctors, doctors were beginning to get worried about the concentrations of strontium in, in, in milk and the effect on babies and leukemia, the leukemia rates were going up. And in order to stop the doctors whistleblowing or doing research or whatever it was, the UN set up this agreement with the, uh, with the IAEA and the WHO and that agreement is still in force. And that's the reason why the WHO didn't do anything after Chernobyl. And there's still this enormous cover-up of the health effects of low-level radiation 
uh, controlled by the nuclear industry. People say, oh, I don't believe in conspiracy theories, but actually this is a real one. There is a conspiracy to cover up the health effects of low-level radiation, yeah, because it is so problem. monstrous. Um, yeah. Right. I just want to say that I've worked as a scientist for 30 years phd in climate change i've done a physics degree where I, uh, i've also done a physics degree where i specifically studied low level radiation and i came at it my attitude originally was i was strongly against uh, nuclear power but from actually studying it from looking at the research from being part of it uh, a lot of the scaremongery about low level radiation it is scaremongery it's all about uh, a comparative risk, any energy production gives risk on different scales. And uh, to give you a, a comparison, to take a cabbage or a cup of coffee out of a physics department is against the law because it is low level radiation. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a high level of iron and other elements in it. And it's, it's a scaremongery. It's, 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 Radiation is a toxic chemical. What's happened in Japan, there's uh, radiation, so it's just a toxic chemical that's been, and it's nasty, it's done, it's done some damage, but really to get into perspective, what's happening with climate change, you know, the shit is going to really hit the fan. We're talking uh, the lack of oil, we're talking, uh, we're not going to be able to feed like. I think, I think you get the point. Thank you. That person going to talk to somebody else now? I mean, I can cut cut. I can, I can, okay, because that's, that's a real problem. Right. You're right. As in, in deeply point, what the problem is with nuclear power is the high level radiation, the, the high no, level waste. You're wrong. But they they don't know how to, uh, to bury it. There was no safe place. But this is the, the the danger with nuclear power. It's not the low level radiation. Okay. It's the not knowing what to do with the high yeah. level radioactive waste. And this is. Right. Thank you very much. Yeah. You should actually just. <laughs> <laughs> so can, we, can, we, can we give that to Richard? Uh, after him, then. Yeah. Well, you and then him, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, hi, Chris. I work. I do work on climate change, and so, in regards to these last ones, I just want to say I'm not. I'm not. I'm not hugely pleased with your answer because, from the point of view of those of us who are not experts, the reason we know that climate change is a problem is because we look to the scientists or the people who are specialists. I work on it. I look very carefully at the people who are saying we have a problem, and I look at the people who are saying we're not having a problem. Sure, I look at their vested interests, but I also look at their scientific credentials and credibility. On the effects of internal radiation, I'm having to do a similar thing because I've got no specialism there. So. Your credibility is very important, and I just, I, I don't want to label points, I know I want to ask a question, but I do want to say, it seems that there's more than just a few people disagreeing with you, but there's a huge split between the scientific establishment, who is disagreeing with you, and you and a group of people outside who, who are saying that there is a huge problem from ingested radiation, and I wonder if you could refer to the, um, was it the committee on the investigation of, what's it called, I mean, the Kabare. Yeah, Kerry, yeah, Committee for the, Examin for the Examination of Radiation Risks of Internal Litters. Yeah. They strongly disagree with you, don't they? So, no. they don't. Well, well, bring us out this point. Explain to us, please, where this split comes. Because, as I said, those of us who are not experts have to go along with the scientific expertise. So, why is there this huge split? Banksters. <laughs> Uh, I, I think I have to say that the reason that there's this huge split is because there are people who are paid to say that low-level radiation is safe. Essentially, it comes down to that. If you're talking about the Cherry Committee, my, uh, Michael Meacher set up this committee in order to examine the health effects of internal radionuclides, um, and, the, and, the, and the remit of the committee was to was to look at the health effects of, of low-level radiation and and, and uh, we had people from because it was the idea to have an oppositional committee with transparency in which there would be two res two responses so we would find there would be a final report in which side, both sides were covered so the people who said it was dangerous would say why it was dangerous and the people who say it wasn't dangerous would say why it wasn't dangerous and this would define um, studies which would which would then show whether it was dangerous or not all right i mean this seems quite reasonable i think don't you so we so we set up this committee and it ran for about three or four years